that fundamental make or buy choice that all companies have to strategize. What they do inside the boundaries of the firm and what they outsource has really profound implications for governance. Simply, if you bring it inside the company, you have to govern it, okay? If it's outsourced, you have to contract for it. So there are different sets of issues. Of course, the uh, technical aspects of it, of whatever you're buying or managing the production of, has very common elements, but they are very different governance challenges. So one of them is more about managing the process of writing good contracts and monitoring the uh, performance of suppliers and having contracts enforced, if need be, through courts or the threat of legal action if your suppliers disappoint. Uh, and of course cultivating uh, potential alternative suppliers so you don't get held up. The other set of strategic issues, uh, if you actually bring it all inside the companies, is really about managing hierarchies. And the famous school uh, of scholarship around what we call the theory of the firm, and particularly with a very famous scholar called Ronald Coase, and he's mentioned in the lecture notes, really emphasized that what firms do in terms of this basic choice, make or buy, comes down to the relative transaction costs. Is it less costly, costly to bring it in-house and then to manage, to govern, indeed, uh, that day-to-day -day production of what you need inside the boundaries of your firm? Or is it less costly, costly to outsource and to effectively enforce contracts that guarantee, to some degree at least, that the suppliers to the firm will act in your interests because you are the principal and they are the agents. So let's talk a little bit about bringing it in-house, okay? So the choose to make rather than to buy. When you set out to control that in a large organization, there's often the danger of what's referred to by academics as hierarchy costs that the larger an organization becomes with uh, many divisions and many functional areas, the greater the hierarchy, the, the various levels of management uh, are involved in the process. So yeah. very often the internal coordination of supplies and functions to other parts of the business becomes highly politicized. Human beings tend to fall into identity politics even inside uh, for-profit companies. And so you'll often see disputes between different parts of an organization wanting to blame each other, for example. And this is sometimes referred to in business analysis as silo effects. A silo is like a storage that you might have for grain, say if you imagine the Midwest of the United States, um, full of grain. So those silos are each their own little hierarchy and they're not talking to each other. Uh, there's a, a, beyond the discussion of this introduction of business class, but one of the big trends in management is towards what's called cross-functional management or matrix management to try and make sure that there is coordination, not just vertically, but horizontally across organizations sharing know-how, effective collaboration. At this point, all we really need to know from a governance perspective is that it can be very, very costly. And these hierarchy costs help to explain why simply communism didn't work. It didn't work in the Soviet system. Eventually, it didn't work in the People's Republic of China and many other places. In command economies, the incentives for people to provide information honestly up the chain of accountability are often very poor. People tend to exaggerate their performance uh, to suit their own interests so they don't get in trouble or they, they don't get punished. And so if the higher up you go, the information, the analysis becomes ever more disconnected from reality till it gets to the top 
and you get the CEO or the top managers uh, or the planners in the old communist system uh, making grand plans based on nonsense, on uh, the basis of information which is not really information but has been spin. People have been presenting their own twist on things to avoid getting into trouble. And But the problem is then in a hierarchical structure is that then commands come all the way back down and again are amplified and more and more disconnected from reality. And so the net effect is for people on the ground, as we say, at the coal face, for example, uh, there is this bizarre disconnect between the reality as they know it and what senior management uh, believes is happening and should be happening. Now we can see that any hierarchical organization runs into this problem. It's a huge problem in military and if anyone has seen the German film Downfall, uh, often used for Hitler parody videos, you would know uh, one of the really striking scenes there when Hitler realizes that World War II is lost in his, when his senior officers finally, very afraid, tell him the truth that uh, many of the uh, army resources that Hitler believed were available to him had been wiped out, uh, had been lost or just simply didn't exist. So we tend to see the more hierarchical an organization is, although it can be speedy at times, gets more and more disconnected from reality. And sometimes they can come a crashing down pretty quickly when the gulf between the reality of the facts on the ground and the organizational dynamics become uh, simply too disconnected. So what we find is that effective companies try and strike a balance between outsourcing, which keeps them closer to reality, for the very simple reason that you have multiple suppliers or aspiring suppliers uh, competing to have contracts, new contracts or contracts renewed. So that is an information sharing process in itself, the competition putting things out to tender, for example, taking Mitsumori Show in Japanese, putting things out to tender, getting a quote, gives you feedback on market conditions. So there's uh, certain advantages in outsourcing. On the other hand, you can be held up, there are problems of reliability, so control can be very valuable too. Some companies do a little bit of both. They have some in-house capacity and they have some outsourcing as well. Sometimes companies very deliberately put pressure on their own internal business units by also outsourcing for some of the same services. It's not uncommon, for example, for even a large university to have its own printing facilities, but also to outsource some of the printing. That sends a message to people in the printing unit, oh, well, uh, if we don't do a good job in a timely way and serve our internal clients, then maybe the management might completely shut us down and move towards complete outsourcing. So there is to some degree in senior management strategy and thinking, tactical thinking, um, the notion of keeping their own employees sufficiently nervous that their jobs might disappear might be outsourced, might be offshored, for example, if it's a global manufacturing firm. So there is a, a sense of trying to overcome the hierarchy costs and the hold-up risks with internalization. Just to, to conclude, to remind us, when you do internalize, and if you entirely rely on internal suppliers, what you've created is an internal monopoly. So the, the print shop in the university, they can be pretty rude, pretty unpleasant to all of their clients, the professors um, who need, need to have things published to distribute to the students, for example, or, the, or exams printed and things like that. Uh, so to overcome this problem of being held up by your own internal business unit, the threat of outsourcing to buy rather than to make 
becomes part of the managerial toolkit, as it were, to uh, keep people on their toes, to keep people responsive. If not, the only alternative would be constantly getting very grumpy at people and threatening to sack individuals for non-performance, which is never a pleasant thing for a company to do. The threat of outsourcing is generally a better discipline upon internal units.